Yes, I'm going early. I'm going early primarily because I don't know the number of places this is getting broadcast to. It might just be YouTube. It could just be Twitch. Who knows? Uh, I, I don't know because I wasn't entirely sure I clicked all the right things. But, you know, hey, here we are all the same. I don't have... Um, I realized I don't know if I still have the Monday night music. So we're going to just click some buttons in like a minute or two. And we're going to just see what happens. Because maybe it's the Monday music. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's way too low. And I need to mix it onto a different button on the board. Who knows? Who knows what's about to happen? This is very exciting. I will also point out that I know the camera is going to be all glitchy and shitty, and I appreciate the the two people who suggested I get a different computer in order to stream better. Thanks. Love that feedback. Um, I'm doing the best I can with the pieces we have. So, yeah, thanks for your feedback. Appreciate it. Um, but no, um, there will be no brand new supercomputer plugged right in here nearly in enough time, let alone with enough uh, money. But I do appreciate you taking the time to tell me my stream sucks and that I should get a, quote, real computer. And, quote, it would be better if I knew what I was talking about. Thanks. Thanks so much. All right, we got like 10, 15 seconds. Let's, uh, let's put a mouthful of water in our faces and then uh, then we'll get going. Cool? Cool. All right, here we go. Let's get hydrated. Oh, man. Why did I put all the glasses so far away? Okay, I don't even have an opening graphic. Like, this is how woefully underprepared I am. This is disgusting. All right, let's just press the button and see what happens. I have no idea if this is playing. I know it's playing on my end, but I don't know if it's playing on your end, so who knows? We'll find out together. And now we'll see how good you are. All right. Look at all my notes. We're good. No matter what anybody sense. tells you, words and ideas can change the world. Oh my god. It is long. We should do something about that. Let's put it on a different button on the Ready board. Let's, let's make a note to do that, you know, on a different day. But hello, everybody. Hi. This is, you know, a thing. Um, kind of last minute, kind of not last minute. I've been planning to do this for a while. Uh, originally, this was supposed to be a PDF. This was going to be a thing you could buy. By the way, if you want any of the PDFs of anything I've ever made, it's payhip.com slash John helps you write better. Um, this was supposed to be a big giant PDF. Well, initially it was supposed to be a small PDF. Then it became a medium sized PDF. Then it became a huge PDF and it became too big, like way too big, like grotesquely too big. So, um, no, it's now a stream and we're bringing back the Monday night streams. If you are a longtime subscriber to the YouTube channel or a fond rememberer of the Twitch stuff, I used to do Monday night streams and highlight, a uh, damn near anything one night a week in advance of the Wednesday night writers chat. And I loved doing it. I really did. I genuinely loved doing it. The, the audiences weren't always so great. It was kind of like me just talking to the cat right over there, but, um, I loved doing it. I loved being able to roll my sleeves up and get relatively crunchy when it comes to sort of crafting and telling stories and, and the bits and the tools to give you the things that you needed in order to do all the things you wanted to do. That was really important to me. But the problem was, well, there were two problems really. One, I didn't know what anybody wanted to talk about. There was very little response other than like, oh, that was really good. I really liked it. But by and large, um, it didn't. I didn't know how to make that transition. I, I didn't run out of things to say. I could be still. I mean, I got a whole. Where's my list? Where's my list? Hang on. I got a whole list of topics. Where's my camera? It's like 46 of them on this legal pad. I got 46 other Monday night streams I could have done. So why? Why didn't they? Why didn't we do them? Because I didn't know what people wanted. 
the best way you can do this, the best thing you can do to let me know what's going on is tell me you like this stuff. You can find me on the bird hell site at awesome underscore John. You can leave a comment here on Twitch and YouTube. You can write me an email. John helps you write better at gmail.com or the writer next door at gmail.com. You can go over to John helps you write better.com and leave me some feedback. The best way that I know how to make the things you want to have would be for you to tell me what it is you need. Because if I have to guess, I am very likely going to guess something that's not entirely what you need to succeed. And that's my goal here. It's not just to sit here in my comfy hoodie and with my new ass haircut and, and just talk at length about whatever. No, I'm here to help you write better. It's literally in the name. So let me help you write better. Tell me what you want to talk about tonight. As you, Where's the graphic? It's over here. Hang on. Let's set that on the right side, John, so I know I'm always pointing the right way. Over there. Right there. There we go. It's uh, We're going to talk about romance. We're going to talk about romance novels, romance structure, romance subplots, romance, romance characters, some world building stuff. Basically, it's going to be a great guide that I want you to be able to show somebody or it's going to be on the podcast feed tomorrow. So feel free to um, put this in somebody's ears who's trying to write a romance novel. And I'm assuming that somebody out there has never heard of me before. So let me give you the short intro. Hi, I'm John. It's my job to help you write better. I've been in the publishing industry since 1996, 97 is when I started. Um, it's probably easier just to say 97 because it was the end of the one school year and the start of the next. But uh, I've been doing this forever, and now it's my pleasure to do this in a far better medium than in a cubicle in traditional publishing. Uh, now I just do this, and I'm a writing coach and sounding board and creative person, and I'm going to help you write better, period, plain and simple. Tonight's romance. We have a decent amount of information to cover. Uh, I am going to try and move slowly through some parts of this because it does get detailed, like detailed, detailed. If for some reason, whatever I'm saying and you're watching this is unclear or you have questions, the best thing you can do is over there, over there in the comments down there or in the chat over there, let me know. And I'll be happy to re-explain something. If you're listening to this and you have no idea how cool my haircut looks or the fact that I really trimmed down the beard, um, and you're just listening and you have things to say, don't just yell you know, into your headphones, that's not going to help anybody. Let me know, reach out on social media, write me an email, let me know. And we'll go over more things. I'd be more than happy to. I do want to say this because this, although this comes from the goodness of my heart, this is my business. If you want to support anything and everything I do, as well as suggest things, jump over to Patreon, patreon.com slash John helps you write better. Two bucks a month, two bucks a month. That's certainly less than a carton of eggs. Uh, two bucks a month gets you tons and tons of stuff, including a discord where you can get all the help you want all the time. Ridiculously. So to whatever degree of detail you want, I strongly super recommend it. Thank you for saying it's an excellent haircut, Megan. I'm really, really proud of it. Like you don't know how mullety it was in the back. Like, like I took him, I had him go all the way down to the skin back here. And I feel like I have a neck for the first time in, oh gosh, like 10, 11 months. This is the best haircut I've had in ages. I'm, I'm very happy with it. I'm less self-conscious about it. And, uh, yeah. This is the, this, I like this. So we're going to talk romance and I'm going to try not to be too self-conscious about like the fact that I lost this beard because I, I want to keep doing this and there's nothing here. So we're just going to start. Cool. We're just going to start because I, I'm so well prepared. So well prepared. First, oh, we're over here. I got to click that button again. Or I should just get used to show where's, come on, showing the other side. We're going to do some basic notes about romance just so we're on the same page, okay? One, not on this chart. This covers romance of either the heteronormative or the LGBTQ plus variety, all right? This applies to you name it. It's got humans in it. We're going to go romance, cool? We're talking about both traditional publishing and self-publishing, 
Cool. And I'm going to cover the more common variants and the more common structures. That doesn't mean, that does not mean it's the only structure. And it doesn't mean that you have to do this to the exclusion of those over there. I'm just saying, you know, these are the more common things you'll find. And there's a reason why you'll find them this way. They're common for a reason. It's because they work. But if you want to like go off somewhere and do your own thing, we could talk about that. Just let me know in the comments what it is, in what direction you're deviating, and I'll do my best to give you a roadmap, all right? But we're going to cover some baselines about romance, just the general stuff. We're not going to talk sales numbers because that's a different topic entirely. We are just talking about how to build these things. Now, whether we're talking traditional publishing or self-publishing or, I don't know, you're making a game of some kind. And it is genre night, Troy. We're doing romance night because um, this is crunchy and the majority of my client base are romance authors right now. I know I'm shocked too. So I want to give like a nuts and bolts, how to build romance in anything you're writing. So if you're writing something and you've got a romance subplot, if you're writing something and you want to throw a love interest in there, parts of this will apply. Parts of this won't. And that's okay. One of the things you as a writer have to learn is to pick and choose the tools that work and learn when to use them. So for now, we're going to get started with some basic notes about romance. And when we talk about romance novels, we are have we we publishing industry have an expectation that it's going to be 80 to 95,000 words. Does that mean you can go over 95? Sure, you totally can. You go as far as you want, you know, sort of kind of a little bit, but understand the expectation of somebody in the traditional side of things as well as the expectation of a reader 80 to 95,000 words. Cool? Straightforward. Also, this is a really common space for any size novel. 80 to 95 is always a safe bet. Sometimes you want to push that up. Just because a word count has like a ceiling doesn't mean you have to like hang out at that ceiling. Like we talk about fantasy novels and we say, oh, fantasy novels can go over 100,000 words. That, that doesn't mean you have to. It just means you can. There's a, there's a distinction to be made here. So romance novels. 80 to 95,000 words. Your most common way of, of getting and delivering this story is with one or two point of view characters. We'll talk about point of view characters specifically in a, in a few minutes, but it's not uh, the MPOV you might find in a fantasy novel where you're jumping from here to here to here to here. You're getting one person and maybe one person plus somebody else. Usually those are our major players in the romance. Usually it's, you know, in a heteronormative romance, it's uh, the female protagonist we're following and the male love interest or whatever genders, however they identify. But it's usually those two people as the points of view. But we'll cover that when we talk about points of view. The most common sort of framework for a romance novel, modern setting earth-based. Now, modern is pretty loose. Modern, if you ever look for that and see that in manuscript wish lists or uh, pimp agent notes or just on random publishing websites, modern refers to anything from like 1950 forward to the present day. And I know that's like a lot of decades and there's a lot of distinction to be made individually in those decades, but it's all part of the modern read white patriarchal supremacist uh, view of time. So modern and earth-based, meaning the rules of earth, gravity, physics, science, temperature, oxygen, si you know, the way we live on earth exists in our romance novel. Does that mean you can't put it on the moon? You can't make two aliens? Sure. You can go back in time and have a fantasy romance. You could go back to the 1920s. You can make it in the 1600s. You can do whatever, but the most common, modern, earth-based. The most common historical time frame for historical romance is the Regency era, which, if you're ever curious when the Regency era was, it's about 1811 to about 1820. That's it. That's it. Beyond that, we get into other kinds of uh, British sounding names. And before that, we get into other sounding European names. Regency is just the early part of the 1800s. 
So chew on that the next time you're like, oh, I like Regency. Understand that all those stories are supposed to be within like a nine-year time frame. Now, maybe that's not a big deal to you, but it's an interesting point to me because there's an awful lot of princesses and, and viscountesses acting as spies or very, very like brassy women doing a lot of stuff in an era between 1811 and 1820. It's a wonder these women don't all bump into each other doing their not typical women stuff. Do I know why it was called the Regency era? Asks Troy. I kind of sort of know why it's called Regency. It has to do with the uh, understanding of sort of hierarchy and social strata. Regent being a word to sort of denote superior aristocratic kind of cultured white cultured um, society people. And it's generally referred to as sort of that courtly era. You might also see it as the courtly era, but that's an older term. Regency is just referring to the, how the social structure white was normally, was normally laid out. Who's in this class, who's in that class, who's allowed to talk to here, who's allowed to have feelings this way. You know, what kind of dresses do we wear? How many times do we fan ourselves? You know, shit like that. Um, and it's because George III was under a formal regency. Sure. I was in the ballpark. I couldn't remember what George it was. So there you go. It's George III under a formal regency. The most minor point on the note is the thing that comes up with conversation. Awesome. Love this group. We're going to keep going, though. Shall we? So we're going to start with plots. Why are we starting with plots when I'm a character guy? Well, that's because, quite frankly, um, romance plot is everything. The main plot of a romance novel, the main plot, the primary thing you should be focusing on for your readers is the relationship between the characters in the romance relationship. Usually that's going to be two people. It doesn't have to be, but it's most commonly two people. That's the center thing at the heart of the story. Everything else, all the, oh my God, who's going to go to the dance? Who's going to go to the prom? Who's going to save my farm? We'll talk about that more in a second. But everything else is a subplot. Everything else. It's not considered a subplot when we're making it. But in terms of the majority of text and how we focus our time and how we set things up, the biggest deal in the book is the romance in the relationship between the characters who are most frequently our point of view characters. Not always, but 90 something percent of the time, they're sort of the center point of our story and everything else is sort of relegated to the edges to whatever distance you need to, because at the heart of the thing, you know, it's all, it's all romance. Think about it this way. At the core of this is this big-ass circle. I don't know if you can see my cursor. At the core of this is a big-ass circle. That's your romance. That's how these two characters feel about one another. And everything else offshoots from that. In, now, this is a perfectly aligned graphic, but it can you know, fly off in any direction to any degree into all their little ancillary pieces about plots and character arcs and this and that. And, oh, by the way, there's this thing. And, oh, by the way, there's that thing. Everything, though, is sort of in service to and orbiting around the relationship of the characters. If you can't nail down the relationship of the characters, your romance novel isn't really much of a romance novel because it's not built around anything. It's, it's going to shift towards fantasy. It's going to shift towards historical drama. It's going to move away from romance and away from the expectation. Is that necessarily a bad thing? No. But if you're like diehard, oh man, we're going to have a romance novel, you got to make sure the romance is front and center. The romance is the thing that people are coming to you for, the thing they're reading the story for, and most importantly, the thing they're expecting you to roll out in your story. So um, the plot, this, this chart looks simple, but we're going to walk through it. So... In a romance plot, I don't care if it's it's the Regency era. I don't care if it's the modern day. I don't care if it's the 1400s on a boat. I don't care if it's last week. I don't care if it's 10 years in the future. Romance plots can be summarized 
as two lives or any number of lives that intersect, interact, and intertwine in that order. Don't mess with that order like 80 to 90% of the time and you're going to be fine. That order matters because each of these steps all in intersect, all in interact, all in intertwine, feed on one another. They're hierarchical. You can't really skip them. If you skip them, you're going to lose the ability to develop going forward. Like if, if you skip the meet cute, there's a question of how your two characters met. If you skip the intimacy, there's no real sense that they are actually deeply connected as you intend for them to be. And We'll talk about all the permutations as we walk through this. So where does this romance plot start? It starts with what's called awareness. Awareness is the idea that character A is made aware of character B generally outside of their control. Sometimes it means I look across the room and there's this other person. I see them. I am made aware of them. Sometimes it's a friend, usually the best friend or the, 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 one of the more immediate secondary characters coming and going, oh my God, there's this person you have to meet. The point of the awareness element in a romance pod is to just tell somebody, hey, there's this thing, there's this character, there's this idea, and it's to help prime the reader to understand that, oh, this is the part of the plot. We're going to talk about how we get these two characters together. Cool. Sometimes the awareness is just verbal. It's just dialogue because you want to draw attention to the scene where I look across the room and I see this person specifically visualizing them. There's some able-bodied privilege in there. Um, it sucks. You're going to run into some able-bodied privilege and every once in a while, some sexist privilege, especially in the heteronormative spaces. I apologize. I, we can work our way around it because you can, if there's anything you can blend together, it's awareness and first sighting. First sighting is the moment where you see the other character and generally one point of view character describes this other character. Oh my God, they're so dreamy as they stand there in the aisle of the grocery store or whatever. They're visualized. They're therefore described and kind of allow, it allows for the reader to picture them. How that character, how our describing character describes the character, so how A talks about B, doesn't necessarily have to be, I'm going to use the word truthful, because it's a little misleading of a word, but uh, I, mean, I mean accurate. Like, you don't have to look at this, A doesn't have to look at B and go, oh, they are exactly this weight and exactly this tall, and they have exactly this much, you know, hair the hair is exactly this long and like it's not a matter of getting that awareness and first sighting hyper specific i am not expecting i don't think anybody is expecting you to randomly in your life look or encounter some other person and immediately perfectly flawlessly you know understand their visual composition oh they're this tall they have they're this handed they're this big they're this small whatever it's unrealistic unreasonable and kind of lazy and convenient just to immediately peg them one way specifically like we're reading the stats off the back of their baseball card. Don't do that. The first sighting is emotional. It's a snap judgment. Oh my God, that person's super attractive. Wow. They have, and then you can lean into some metaphor if you want or some simile to describe it. Oh, wow, they have hair like sunset and eyes that are deep and deep or something. Like, it's more important in the, in the first sighting not to relay some kind of factual dry information, but to relay what the character thinks of the character being sighted. Why is that more important? because you want the reader to connect with our POV character. You want our reader to feel how they feel or really be in the ballpark of how they feel. And if you are giving straight, dry fact, even if it's technically accurate, I'm making air quotes, 
uh, you lose some of that emotional leverage. You, you, you lose some of that emotional wiggle room because instead of saying, you know, oh, I find them very, very attractive. I, I can't stop staring at them. You're giving out, oh, they're, they're five foot seven and a half. And they, they seem to be, you know, overdeveloped and the, they never skipped a leg day. Um, it seems that they haven't shaved in exactly 17 hours. Like you're giving details that while accurate and maybe visual are not representative of how a person communicates interest or vision. It, it matters. So let the awareness and the first sighting be what are called biased events. They don't need to be complete. They don't need to be, you know, hyper specific. Like we're taking down court transcript and stats, let them be character biasing. It's also going to reveal to the reader what your point of view character thinks and feels and what they think and feel is important. If character A cites character B, but I only talk about, I don't know, four of their traits, those four traits are presumed to be more important than the five other things I didn't talk about. Why? Because I talked about them. It must matter. You're, it ends up on the page. He, the, the other character could have 15 things, but if four stand out, then I'm only going to talk about four. And over time, I can bring in more things as I write it, but I don't need to lay it all out at once. It's just the first sighting. Eventually, though, from first sighting, we have to get these two characters to meet. They have to intersect. Their lives have to cross paths. That intersection, when it's positive... When it's generally funny or lighter in tone or relatively low stakes and harmless, meaning nobody's directly hurt, nobody's like holding firearms or other weapons to each other, no one's threatening the other with death, it's called a meet cute. As in, the characters meet in a cute way. Are there other kinds of meets? Sure. There's meet serious. Uh, you see this in any situation where there's a power dynamic between characters like the point of view character goes to a lawyer or a doctor. Those are the two most common ones. And all of a sudden they find themselves deeply enamored with the person who's going to get them out of some kind of trouble or assist them in some way. And they use that power dynamic to establish the reason for their meeting. The reason for your meeting Seems like it should be a big deal because a lot of writers at this point want to have a thing that feels very like believable or relatable. You know, like if you're going to have two people in an office setting with a meet cute, somebody's going to want to reference their own lived experience with cubicles and offices. And I get where you're going. Like that makes sense. I hear you. But at the same time, uh, the reader doesn't need it to be perfect. The reader doesn't need a transcript. The reader just needs it to be a thing that happens. Like if if you know in your job there's no, I'm going to make something up because I've never worked in an office like that. If you know there's no 1030 coffee break, sure. Because I know for me there's a 1030 tea break. But um, if you know there's no 1030 coffee break because in the company that you're modeling this on there's no break, the reader's not going to care. So the conditions of the meet cute just need to satisfy the idea that it's cute and that the characters meet more than the accuracy or realism of the character relationship. Oh my God, they wouldn't stand near the photocopier. That's in a different room. Who cares? There's no quiz. Nobody's going to double check. Just let them meet cute or meet serious or meet sad or... Um, they don't call it... Oh, meet hot. They don't call it meet horny. They meet hot, meaning both characters are immediately physically uh, wanting to be intimate. They're immediately horny on main. And that's generally sort of an indicator of, okay, this is the direction and the speed at which the thing, the, the rest of the relationship happens. Generally with a meet cute, there's no sense of earned action. They didn't have to work very hard to meet cute. They just sort of bump into each other in the hallway or they're, they both happen to be in the same place or there's a in-story narrative reason for them to meet. It's not like uh, I have to work hard to get it. It's already on the books. It just happens. The reader is okay with some level of convenience at the meet cute level because it's just a meet cute. Now, sometimes the meet cute leads to another thing, leads to another element where the two characters intersect and that's called the first interaction sometimes the meet cute 
is immediately the first interaction. A first interaction is any time where the two characters spend a scene together. Maybe that's a date. Maybe that's a conversation where they're just walking. Maybe they're working together on a thing. Maybe they're hiding in an elevator from the monster. Maybe they're doing whatever. It's the first time, though, the characters are doing more than just meeting. The goal of a first interaction is to make sure the characters, for lack of a better word, vibe. You want to make sure that the characters sync up, that there is some reason, and it could be physical, like, oh, they're hot. It could be emotional. Oh, they get me. It could be mental. I think things. It could be social. Oh, we all share a friend pool or whatever. It could be anything. But there are reasons for future interactions to happen. There are reasons for interactions to happen that stem from the characters more than the environment. A lot of writers will generate interactions based on the environment. Well, I guess I'll see you every Tuesday. You know, oh, golly gee, we got to be here. And that works in the short term. But eventually, you have to deviate from that. Because if you're always going to have this sort of arranged, convenient, scheduled interaction, it's never going to feel terribly organic. And it's not going to feel like the relationship is developing if they're just sort of running into each other because they have to, making air quotes, have to run into each other for the sake of the story. First interaction is, in some cases, a big deal because some stories want to lean you towards love at first sight. Love at first sight is the idea that, oh my God, I see that other character and bang, zoom, I'm in love with them. Some people take this too far. When you take love at first sight too far, they, a writer can forget that they have a job to do with this relationship they're writing because they just say, oh, well, the character's in love with him. You know, A's in love with B. As if that excuses or eliminates their need to do any developing because they just said it. You know, why aren't you paying attention? A's in love with B. I'm done. You're not done. You're, you're not done. You can say it, but the reader has to believe it. If you just tell the reader something, A loves B, the reader's going to go, uh-huh, yeah, because they don't have, and I know we talk about this a lot, they don't have any context for it. The reader needs context. Watching this relationship develop is what the reader comes to the romance book for. If you just tell them, bang, they're in a relationship, there you go, ta-da, we're done, yay! Why would the reader stick around? I know for some writers it's difficult to sort of craft this relationship, that it's hard to do, that there are pieces that just seem like, how do I write this? How do I make it not boring? Well, good news, we're going to go, um, no, we're over here on that side. Nope, we're on that side, sorry. i got to click the button again. Stupid mirroring on the camera. We're over there. Um, we move from intersection which was sort of environmentally driven. Oh, yes, it's an arranged first blind date. Oh, we both work on the same project in the office. Oh, you're the lawyer who's going to get me out of this stupid lawsuit or whatever. Intersection is environmentally generated because that's how our story gets started. However, because the characters establish some feelings in the meet-cute and first interaction, we're led to other interactions. That's column number two. Interactions, those could be dates, those can be more conversations. They're just more times, more scenes where the characters are together. What are they doing? Who knows? They could be doing anything. They could be doing oodles of stuff. You know, they could be talking all about different kinds of whatever's going on in the world of the story, but it's a set of interactions. How many interactions? I don't know. How many do you want to write? It... There's no magic number here. For some people, the story is going to be the buildup and the payoff. You know, the big he- the big end of the story is their first like sexual encounter for some characters. That's fine. Or the first time they kiss. That's fine. So everything prior to that is just a lot of interactions that layer sexual tension or layer physical intimacy tension or something like that. That's just as valid. That's just as fine as, you know, the characters who go to the bar and hook up and then they actually get to know each other and fall in love. Totally fine. You just need to have these characters interact. Doing stuff. Sometimes it's date stuff. Sometimes it's not date stuff. It's entirely up to you. 
based on what it is you want them to do. Now, the result of interaction, however many you have, is that one or more characters develops feelings. Development of feelings is a critical element in a romance story. Because if you don't develop feelings and then express them to the reader, there's no point in the romance. If you don't have, now if I'm going to do this in a hyperbolic way. If you don't have that character writing in her journal before high school that, oh my God, that boy is so dreamy, then the reader's not really going to know how into the other character the first character is. You need to develop the feelings both between the characters and for the reader's benefit. You can't just say, oh, they're in love. You can show it over time, incrementally, in pieces. It starts small. I think I like this person. And it snowballs into, oh, I'm, I'm down for this person. Absolutely. Generally, it's, a, it's called a positive slope, meaning it starts small and it only improves over time. That is most common because it gives you the most level of escapism. It's the most fantastic. It's the most, oh, that's very satisfying. But it doesn't need to be. If you want to, like, give them a, a very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A very Sid and Nancy kind of messy, toxic, you know, we're either, you know, uh, throwing things at each other or yelling or we're jumping into bed together. If you want to make it messy and, you know, big drama, that's fine too. You just have to develop those feelings as a result of interactions. Now, sometimes those happen in separate scenes. Sometimes they happen in the same scene. As long as they happen, you're fine. Make sense? Both characters, well, all your POV characters, if you have polycules going on, all your point of view characters will develop feelings. The order in which they do can be fodder for your story. What if one person catches feelings before the other does? Well, there is some tension in our story that we can work out when we talk about subplots and arcs and stuff. But eventually, both characters or all characters involved develop feelings. And the feelings eventually lead to intimacy. Now, you can define, I guess will be the best word, you can define intimacy any way you want. It's hand-holding, it's kissing, it's sex, it's sharing a, a, a deeply troubling backstory and then getting a hug. It's, you know, finally letting someone over to your house. It's whatever you term intimacy to be. For some, particularly in the more dramatic end of the pool when it comes to romance fiction intimacy is, is the forgive the pun the climax of the story the whole point is to get them into bed and that's the goal intimacy unlike the meet cute is earned and it has to be earned meaning the characters have to do work to get there if the characters don't do work to get there like they just hook up in the middle of chapter two then future intimacy still needs to be earned. And it's earned from the development of feelings caused by the interactions. Do you see the hierarchy that's starting to build? Our first intersection, all the awareness and the first sighting and the meet cute and stuff, was environmentally based. They had reasons the story gave them to hook up and get together. But now, in an interaction standpoint, as the two characters have chosen to get together to date, to see each other, to call each other, to talk to each other, to text, to visit or whatever, to hook up, to be uh, friendos with benefitos. You know, those are character agency things. They chose this. That migration away from the story told us to, essentially, to we're choosing this is what's going to help connect your reader to the characters. If you, you know, race to that intimacy because you really want to write like a sexy scene for whatever reason or a passionate scene or a caring, romantic, tender scene, whatever it might be, it's fine. You can do that. The world's not going to come to an end because your two characters hooked up on page six. However, if you're trying to make this a romance novel, you are going to have to kind of not backtrack, but create situations where you can further develop that relationship beyond just them 
jumping into bed in the first chapter. Interactions lead to the development of feelings. The development of feelings, because the feelings are so intense, because they're so urgent, because that's what the story is built on, it leads to intimacy. Can you have multiple intimacy things? Sure. Characters start by, you know, the the old heteronormative cliches of, uh, you know, their hands brush. And then all of a sudden, then, you know, they kiss in the dark. And the next thing you know, they're tearing off clothes and everybody's just, you know, finding new ways to get flexible and stretch their hamstrings. Loads of intimacy is possible. It's just that this section, this middle column, this interact column can go on and on and on for a while. And you as an author have to know when to rein it in. That's up to you. There's no magic number here. It's not like, oh, four sex scenes, please. I will tell you this. There used to be formulas for this. Things used to be very boxy and very regimented. Now it's not so much. Also, things were very hetero for a very, very long time. And it was presumed that stories were meet cute, development, intimacy, resolution. Very simplistic. Um, think about any sort of early lifetime movie, any Hallmark Channel movie. They simplify the living hell out of this formula. So why is this formula now more detailed? I don't know if you know this, but the entire non-hetero community exists and they are directly responsible for expanding these things. It was LGBTQ plus stories that detailed out the meet cute and the first interaction and spent time developing feelings because for so long, uh, any kind of queer fiction was basically the label they slapped on any erotica, even if it was hetero, even if it was really been like what we would now consider like mom kinky, even if it was not very taboo and it was only slightly racier than normal, um, they were so quick to kind of like marginalize the already marginalized that when this formula really started to expand and this formula really got like mapped out this way, uh, stories became immediately more uh, vibrant and more logical and less kind of cookie cutter. If you strip this down to its barest sort of like uh, awareness, meet cute, interactions, feeling, intimacy, complication, resolution, you strip it down to its barest bits. After a while, all the stories start feeling the same because you're not giving any room. There's no, there's no ground for depth. You're not allowing it to be anything other than that minimalist sort of stuff that it needs. So that's intimacy. That's the first two-thirds of our chart. I'm going to get a mouthful of water, and then we're going to talk about how to intertwine because I want to make the, I want to draw you the distinction between interaction and intertwining. I put all my liquid way the hell over there, so i got to stretch out of frame to do it. I apologize. So intersection was environmentally generated, narratively generated. Something outside the character's control started this off. Interaction is the demonstration of the character's agency. They're choosing to get together. Intertwining is where because they are together, because they demonstrated agency, now there are consequences to that middle column. Column three, the intertwining column, is all consequential relative to the second column. So because we interacted and because we developed feelings, we got intimate. Because we got intimate, and maybe that second column cycles through a few times, the intimacy we have deepens. Now, let's just be clear what that means. Sometimes, in some cases, that means characters, you know, start sharing emotional things with each other. They start expressing love to one another. Sometimes, in more sexualized romance novels, they just fuck in different places and in different ways. You know, this is how we try some different positions. This is how we try some different acts. We bring in toys, we bring in this, we bring in that. But intimacy deepens. That's the language we tend to use when talking about this stuff. But it could also just be expands or increases or happens more intensely or more vigorously or something. It's just that we don't, we don't have the initial 
magic ta-da moment of first intimacy anymore, but we've been together for a while, so we care more about each other, so we do more shit together. And we, we have more feelings, and we have more time together, and we know each other better. It is critical in the deepening of intimacy that you end up with characters who have not only like had giant paragraph monologues of, oh my God, here's my troubled backstory. Well, here's my troubled backstory. It's that you've established or set up in a way where characters feel like real people and they communicate to each other in broken, messy, incomplete ways. Not so that the story fixes them because that's not how human people work, but that even in their brokenness, even in their awkwardness, there's an attempt they they try to stay together. They try to make it work. They try to, you know, have more reasons to jump in bed or, or, or conceive children or hook up or abandon their old ways and change in the course of their arc. They, they care more and therefore they act on it more. That sounds all fine, well, and good, but your romance plot does not exist in a vacuum. It might be a very shallow world, but there's still a world on the other side of your romance story. And this is where possible complications come in. Now we're going to talk about this in more depth when we talk about subplots, but complications, whatever they might be, are the outside world pushing in on the relationship. This is the, you know, the terrible secret of the stubbled ab having, you know, boyfriend finding out that he's on the, you know, he's on the run from the law. The possible com complication is that, you know, the sheriff has tracked him down or somebody's mom disapproves of the relationship. And she's, you know, you could, he's telling everybody with a finger wag and a generally racist sneer, they have, they can't see each other. Complications are the outside world putting pressure on the relationship. Why do we need this? Because if your possible complications are not external, you are forcing the complications to come from the relationship. We can't be together. Now, if you fuck this up, if this doesn't work, you end up with what I refer to as the Natalie Portman problem. It does not actually have a great name. It's the idea that in the second Star Wars movie, Natalie Portman turns to, to Hayden Christensen and says, Annie, we can't be together. I'm a senator and you're a Jedi. As if that's supposed to be the clearest way to express a complication in our story. It's not a bad complication, but it needs so much more development, which is why they have to like shoehorn in the Jedi code and all this stuff. But it still doesn't explain why the senator can't hook up with whoever the hell she wants. She's a senator. But that's neither here nor there. The point is your complications are generally going to be external for the majority of romance novels. Why? Because it gives us a chance to do more than just talk about the relationship. It helps us tie things in together. In a, I once had this explained to me by a queer author that this is why porn has plot. You know, yeah, we're totally there to have these two characters hook up, but they did order a pizza. Or the sink is clogged and they had to call a plumber. Like there are real world, real world situations that press in on the relationship. When you're, when you don't want to do that, how do I say this? If you don't want to go the external route, you can go the internal route. However, be careful. If your internal complication is, I don't know how I feel about this person. And you start changing or reforming how that character feels or questions that relationship, you are somewhat to some degree undoing the deepening of intimacy that led us here in the first place. Because if character A is with character B and character A is seriously doubting, oh my God, I don't know what I should do. I don't know if I should stay with character B over here. What, what's going on? How, how deep can that intimacy be? Now, maybe there's story drama you can mine there. Maybe that's the space you want to have the story in. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But understand that you're probably better off with external complications by themselves or a combination of internal versus external. So maybe it's a, it's a little bit one character feels maybe not so worthy of the other character. And also, oh, by the way, the evil CEO is trying to bulldoze the orphanage. Internal and external together. Also, that combination, it feels more realistic. Readers can relate to that. Because in their own lives, dating or being married to or being single by themselves with the rest of the world, 
they they don't only have themselves. They live in a world with people and rules and structures and shitty capitalists and all different kinds of things. So complications matter. They're a big deal. However, because this is a romance novel, there has to be resolution. Something has to give, change, be impacted, be affected. Ideally, this is done under the character's agency. They take these actions. They do this shit. They're the ones who do the things that resolve the complications. If you take that out of the character's hands, it's not the end of the world, but understand that you're making the whole thing less satisfying. Because if I'm in crisis and A and B are like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And then all of a sudden, like, you know, the magic deus ex machina shows up or randomly somebody just goes, oh, here, here you go. Have a thing. Have the perfect solution to your problem. And it resolves everything. The characters didn't have to work very hard for it. And all of a sudden, what was a big problem suddenly evaporates. How big a problem was it really? So try your best to make sure that that resolution comes from character action. It's okay if it has connections to outside world stuff. It's okay if the characters do stuff and these there's some other components. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. However, the majority of the rev- resolution, the majority of the drive to that resolution should come from the characters. That whole formula, four things, three things, seven things, ten things total, if you can understand those ten bits, intersect, interact, and intertwine, you can craft a romance plot with two characters, three characters, five characters, however many characters. Just make sure that throughout whatever permutations of your character geometry you have, you are hitting all of these things to some degree. This is why when you get into your larger polycules, some things get real quick. Like, oh, hey, look, it's those four people. I'm going to date them all. And some things are really, really drawn out because you're going to have to tick all the... I don't want to make it sound like you're just ticking boxes at some point, but you're going to need all 10 of these components. At the very least, you're going to need four. You're going to need meet cute, first interaction, uh, intimacy, Complications resolution. So what's that? Five, one, two, three, four or five. You're going to need, you know, those at the very least because that's story structure. Here, though, this is your basic formula. Everybody good? Makes sense? Because I'm going to go to the next slide because we spent hella long on that one. Subplots. Yep, there we go. It's that button. Subplots. If the romance relationship is the main thing, subplots are everything else, right? So anything that would be a plot elsewhere is a subplot for us. Saving the mall shop. Something happened with our kids. Uh, one I just uh, one of the, my favorite examples is there's a problem in space. And oh, by the way, you know, we have this relationship going on. What would be a major plot is a subplot for us, but also what are subplots everywhere else are still subplots here. Like, will my daughter go to college or are we going to fix the car? Now, Troy asks a question. Do you think romance audiences are easier to write for because they expect a formula to be followed so closely? No, they are harder in some cases to write for because even though everybody's writing to the formula, you still have to show what you would do with the formula. You got to put your own spin on it. You got to develop your own pieces just because it's a formula, just because, yep, it's two people. They're hooking up. They're doing this. They feel this. They say this, they do that. And we're done. Doesn't mean you are, what's the word I want to use? Absolved of the responsibility of figuring out how you would express it. So they've seen so many flavors of so many things. They are incredibly savvy which is why when we talk about subplots, you generally find newer authors really coming out of the woodwork and really finding like really far out things like, oh my God, there's a problem in space as opposed to something far more terrestrial and maybe even a little mundane. You don't have to go like way out on a limb in order to create some subplots. You don't. There's no need. You can, but you don't have to. Take what craft your plot, craft your story, and make it the best you can, and it's going to work just fine. So how many subplots can you have? 
Yes. I know that's a terrible answer. I know people are like, I need a number. All right, here's what I tell people. Here is my professional opinion. You need one main plot, maybe two, three at the most subplots, okay? Because that's more than enough to juggle. Two subplots and a main plot will butter your bread all the way through and it'll be just fine. Now, what those things specifically are, I leave that to you. But it doesn't need to be made hyper-complicated. It's just that subplots are less focused on. They are kind of off over there to the side. They are important to the story, but they're not like the thing the story is about. You're not reading the, you know, you're not reading the romance novel because, oh my God, the, the evil CEO is burning down the orphanage. It's what are these two characters going to do? And oh my God, the problem they're facing in addition to figuring out how to have their relationship is that the uh, CEO is burning down the orphanage. Subplots matter, but they have to serve in some way, shape, or form part of the character arcs or the relationship. If your subplot is just a thing, like, oh, by the way, there's this, there's this event happening. It's never really going to click with the reader. It's never going to feel satisfying, and it's going to be really, really hard to tie it together in a way that matters because we've, if character A and character B are spending so long in their relationship and then, oh, by the way, there's a tiger on the loose... Okay, sure. How big a, like, to suddenly manufacture a reason why, oh my God, we've been doing this for 200 pages and we just now realize there's a tiger. It's hard to make that tiger-based problem feel like a legit threat. Even if you had little notes and little news blurbs every time they get in the car to drive to the motel to have, like, dirty fantasy sex, the radio news announcer comes on and says, look out, there's a tiger. Like, that's, that's not enough. That's, that's not enough at all. Like that's not that different than being able to drive down the street and just seeing a billboard that says it. You need to develop it if you're going to put it in the story. So because romance readers read a lot, like a lot, a lot, there's a reason why this is considered by many people to be the most dense genre packed with the most authors because they're so dense and there's so many people doing this and people are really, really trying, even though there's a formula there's still a lot of individual room for creativity and still a necessity for you to stand out despite there being a formula. Don't mistake formula for paint by numbers. You still got to paint your own canvas. Off we go. This is a romance subplot map. Here's how you lay this out. Now, you might notice that this looks incredibly similar to basic three-act structure. That's because it is three-act structure. We've just miniaturized it. So in the first act, our subplot is developing. It's being introduced, right? That's the brown part of this triangle over here where it says first act. Then there's a line. That line is called an event. That event is a thing that happens, like the characters discover that the problem is a problem. That leads us into the second act where the stakes and danger increase as well as the threat or urgency of the subplot. Oh my God, the CEO is everywhere. The tiger is on the loose, whatever it might be. Now, eventually, as we end the second act, the middle part of this subplot, we reach a section of the story called build. The build is the section of developing the subplot that builds us towards climax. The build is preceded by an event and the build ends with an event that takes us into climax. Build is sandwiched between two events. Can you skip that middle event? Yeah. Should you? It depends on the story you're writing. But you definitely need to transition from build into climax. There's a typo on my chart that's supposed to say climax. I did just, I'm sorry, I copied the same square twice. Climax is the highest point of tension in a subplot. It's the thing where it seems most dangerous. It seems where the problem is looming and huge and the characters need to do something in order to resolve it. 
They need to confront the evil CEO. They need to wrestle the tiger. They need to have a car wash that saves the malt shop. They need to ski down Devil's Mountain. They need to win the drag race at Danger Point. Whatever it is, the climax of the story. Now, generally, you want this climax to affect and be impacted by the character arcs of the characters. Because if I've already got all my shit together and I'm already in this great relationship with character B, then it really matters less to me, the character, how the subplot goes, because I already have this relationship and that's the main plot of the book. So eh, who cares? You need to make it care. So try your best to align story climax, i.e. the climax of the relationship, the highest points of tension thereof, with some climax E or climax-ish stuff in the subplots. Once that climax is, res- is done, though, we immediately move to resolution. We immediately just start wrapping things up. Now, because I can only draw certain size triangles in Canva, uh, that triangle is not the right size, and you can have a pretty abrupt resolution, but you do need to have a resolution. If you just stop your subplot at when the climax is done and hand wave it away or never bring it up again, it's going to feel undone, messy, untidy, unclear. Because one of the benefits that resolution gives is it gives the reader a chance to understand and contextualize as well as catch their breath. So if you had the evil CEO who's, you know, angry that, oh my God, they raised the money and the, the orphanage we'll be fine and I can't bulldoze it. Ah, let's go evil goons. And then, you know, instead of having them drive away angrily on their bulldozer or having, you know, some moment where everybody parties at the orphanage, if you just stop, it's going to feel like you're missing something. It's going to feel undone. So please do not neglect resolution when it comes to subplots. I'm going to pause there for a hot second and ask you if you have any questions about the ton of stuff we just talked about. Also, I need to put more water in my face because now we're going to go talk about the other major thing in this point of view characters. Are there, though, any questions on plots and subplots? By the way, if you're watching this on YouTube or watching this on Twitch and you're enjoying this and this is helpful to you, please, if you're on YouTube, like and subscribe, click the bell for notifications, do all the youtube stuff. It really does make a difference to me. It would help me a great deal. If you're watching this on Twitch, feel free to give a follow because I'll be doing more stuff like this for other genres. I'll be doing more stuff like this for lots of stuff again. And I would love to know what would help you succeed. So best way to do that is to follow so that when I do these things, you'll know. Or if you really dig this and you want, you definitely want to help, go subscribe. It would literally change my life. You have no idea. Other questions while I finish this cup of water and reach for my next one. Yes, no, anybody? All right. Let us march on through our point of view characters. Point of view characters. Now, the most common way of expressing point of view is either with one narrator, who we will call A, or two narrators that we will identify as A and B. You'll most commonly see A as the main character. Sometimes in hetero romance, that's usually a woman or a female identifying character. Um, And that's generally because the presumption is your readership is predominantly female or female identifying. I don't know how much water that still holds. I don't know how accurate that is. It's accurate enough that it's persisted, but lots of bullshit is just accurate enough to have it persist. But generally, uh, your predominant major one POV is assumed to be female. You don't have to roll with that. If you're writing queer fiction and there are no women or female identifying characters, then that's not going to work for you. Either way, if you're going with just A, it's just one narrator. 
first person, third person, present tense, past tense. That's entirely up to you. There's no rule. There's no thing that says, ah, you're writing a romance. It has to. Nope. You just need to have a point of view character through whom the reader can attach and through whom the reader can lens the story. One character. The other common approach for this, be it queer or heteronormative, is what's called AB, which is the alternation between two point of view characters. Again, A is presumed in heteronormative spaces to be female and B, masculine, male, male identifying. Again, if you're not writing heteronormative, it really doesn't matter as long as you have two point of view characters as opposed to one. When you set this up though, if you're using multiple point of view characters, you need to figure out their pattern or their distribution of chapters or sections over the course of the book. Your most common patterns are alteration or alternation, I should say. A, then a B, then an A, then a B, over and over and over all the way through the book. Somebody gets an A, you know, the A chapters are followed by B chapters and you go all the way through the story. Sometimes though, you can double up. Sometimes, you know, you do two A's and then two B's. Sometimes you do three A's and a B. You can move in whatever order you want. There is no perfect pattern. However, and this is important, if you have, I'm going to make something up just for the sake of hyperbole, let's say you have five A's and then a B and then seven A's and another B, and by the time you go all the way through your story, you have 15 or 16 A's and maybe less than 10 B's. Arguably, you've done it right, but at that point, you're so rarely bringing B's point of view into the story that what you're ending up with is a challenge and a red flag that maybe B shouldn't be a POV character. You're checking in with them so infrequently and so rarely that it feels like you kind of forgot and we're just shoehorning them in. There is no perfect pattern though. If you can substantiate it and show that you're developing for a reason, there's a reason why B chapters only show up at certain intervals. It can be okay, but understand again, if we're looking at what's expected in traditional spaces, because you want to go traditional, ABAB or AABB or something more mechanical like that is expected. But again, there's no perfect pattern. I do want to give you, though, three questions to think about when it comes to POV. First and foremost, biggest question is whose story is it? Whose story is it? Do you, when you think about it, when you answer that question to yourself, does one character immediately come to mind or do you immediately split it into two snap judgment answer? There's nothing wrong with it. Learn to trust your gut. It can be good. It doesn't mean you're automatically wrong. It doesn't mean you're doing it bad. If you sit there and you think about your story and you put on your thinking face and then all of a sudden, when you answer the question, whose story it is, you only seem to be talking about one character. Chances are the way you've best framed it. It's because you have one POV character. You do not need to alternate. You can tell a romance story with one POV character. It's totally fine. You don't need to. It's popular, but that doesn't mean you have to do it. Lots of shit is popular. Fascism is popular. No one needs to do that. So whose story is it? That's question number one. Question number two, related to question number one, who do you want the reader to connect with? In fact, it's so popular, I've got it on this slide twice. Who do you want the reader to connect with? What character? Why? Why do you want them to connect with this character? Is it just because they have a cool job or you've given them a sweet name? What is it about this character that you think the, char the reader should go, oh, this shit's interesting. I want to see where this goes. One of the things that's critical at that point when you're asking that question is how does the reader relate to this character? In what ways could a reader see themselves in this character? If you're writing fantasy romance and you've got some like real far out fantasy character stuff, like, I don't know, you've got a lizard person or like a half robot bugbear or something. 
It might be really cool. Sounds rad as hell. But if the reader can't really relate to whatever fantasy contraption you've developed, how useful is it? Oh, they're a they're a they're an immortal being of infinite wealth. Okay. How is your reader supposed to relate to that? Now, some people will get very frustrated with that question because they'll go, it's the escapism. Everybody wants to live forever and everybody wants to be rich. I think one of those two questions is true. Um, but it's also impractical because the likelihood of us finding immortal, infinitely rich beings seems pretty remote to me. But maybe that's just me and my life experience. Don't rely on the escapism as your sole way your reader's going to relate to your character because that will only take you so far. Because, sure, everybody wants to be infinitely rich and not have to worry about how they're going to you know, afford eggs tomorrow. But if that's the only thing your character has going for them, what does that really say about your development? Who do you want the character to connect with? And why? Why connect with them in those ways. It's worth thinking about when you're framing out your points of view. Some notes about shaping your POV chapters. Now, most of the time, this is going to be chapters. It's easiest that way. Just for you from a production standpoint, it's easiest if you're moving from chapter to chapter, A to B, A to B. Does it have to be chapters? No. It's helpful because it's easy for a reader to follow. But if you're writing a chapterless story, you just need to indicate some way clearly to the reader outside of the context of the story. You need some framing devices so that the reader knows, oh, okay, so now we're now the other character's taken over. You can't rely on it solely being an in-world thing. Epistolaries, subheadings, labels, something so that if you're writing both points of view in first person and one character starts talking I and then you hit enter three times and the second character starts talking I, the reader isn't absolutely confused that it seems like everything's changed. You need it sorted out. This, however, sets up a situation where a lot of authors end up repeating themselves. Like a scene will happen and we'll get it from A's point of view. And then we'll also get some percentage of it from B's point of view after it already happened. Sometimes this is because writers don't write things continuously. You know, they take six to eight months off or whatever. They take some irregular jump in time and it's been a while and they, they kind of feel like, I can't remember where I left off, so I'll just keep going. But you want to avoid repeating yourself because what that's, it does two things when you do that. One, it's boring as shit. And two, um, it shortens the amount of material you have by repeating yourself. You're suggesting, I don't have anything new, so we're going to talk about the same thing over and over again. You don't need to cover one thing from both perspectives in order for the reader to get a sense of what it was that happened. Why? Well, let me give you an example. You and I are talking right now. I'm doing the majority of the talking. I can't hear you. I have to assume you're listening. While this is going on, if you're distracted, I can only infer that from the silence on my monitor. I don't see comments. I have to assume you're listening. My assumption that I, you're, you're listening is going to influence my speaking. It's a reactive thing. Not just because John is anxious, but because John is human. And characters can take inference and implication from reaction. If I say a thing and you have a strong reaction, oh, holy shit, and I back up too, then all of a sudden what we're left with is a situation where we don't need to stop and just repeat. You know that thing that just happened? Because we were both there. You don't need to recap a thing that just happened. We're not, you know, goldfish with very short-term memories. The character can react, and that can be enough. You want to alternate chapters and not scenes so that readers can follow along. It can be very tempting to hopscotch back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. I get it. It makes sense in your head that way. 
I can't guarantee it's going to make that same sense in the reader's head. And ultimately, from a production standpoint, we've got to consider the reader at that level. The story, much like remember when we talked about how if you're doing like 11 A's and then a B, it's really A's story. It's important to remember, though, that the story is the sum of all its parts. All of it. It's never down to one chapter, one point of view, one time to do all the heavy lifting. If that's the case, you don't have much of a romance structure. You, arguably, you don't have much of a fictional structure, a fictive structure, because it's really only one scene that's doing all your stuff. One scene that's all your plot. One scene that's all your theme. One scene that's all your character. You want to be able to have a, an accumulation, a population of ideas. A plus B plus B plus A plus A plus B plus however many sets up your point of view and sets up your story. The big takeaway here as we're crafting our scenes and crafting our chapters and laying things out and making sure we're developing our feelings and deepening our intimacy and having repeat interactions is this shorthand. I think it's the best shorthand formula for you to keep in mind writing whatever you're writing. Romance is the reward for growth or change. So we have a character. Over the course of them being in this relationship, being in this potential relationship, having these interactions with a character with another character, they're presumably going to grow and change, presumably for the positive. Interacting with B makes A better in some way. And because A is made better by persistent interaction with B, that's how you develop A and B as a romance. Maybe it goes the other way. Maybe B corrupts A. And then romance is the reward for negative growth or declining change. But either way, your A and your B develop those feelings as a reward for growing and changing from who they were into who they are. Understanding that and narrowing down the division of labor, essentially, for your point of view characters. Chapter one is going to be this person. Chapter two is going to be that person. Chapter one goes this far. Chapter two goes that far, so on and so forth and so on, is going to help you organize this story. If you want to see that as formulaic, that's up to you. It's not entirely determined how many pages it should be or how many scenes it should be. That's variable. But Understanding and planning this out with some organization is going to make this loads easier because the interior stuff of it, the scenes themselves, the plot, the what happens next, that's plenty complicated already. It doesn't need to be made worse or harder or more so. That's point of view. Which leads us to character arcs. Are there any questions so far on character arcs? This gets a little abstract. Just a warning. When you have A and B, two POV characters, one of them is going to be the primary and one of them is going to be the alternate. Primary is the character that goes first. If you have one point of view, guess what? They're the primary throughout. Why am I talking about this? Why does this matter? Because what's called the greater arc goes to the primary character. The lesser arc goes to the alternate character. Let's define those terms. The greater arc is the character arc you're going to spend more time in the book talking about and developing. It's going to be the ones that... I'm going to use a word in air quotes, matter more. The other one matters, but you're not spending as much time with it. For instance, let's use a book I worked on already. A woman, heteronormative romance, a woman uh, is torn between possibly cheating on her marriage with her old college flame or strengthening her marriage with her husband. That's her conflict. That's her challenge. Because remember, a character arc is a challenge. It's a question posed to the character that has to do with how the character feels and how they interact with the world. That arc of, oh my God, am I going to cheat on my husband? Am I, am I falling in love with this new person? Am I, am I cheating? Am I ruining my marriage? Is, you know, what's, what impact is this other character having on our lives? 
because it's dominating a majority of the story, it's the greater arc because we're following that character more than any other character in the story. Now, that other character, the former college flame who's come back into our main character's life, they have an arc as well, but it's lesser. Why is it lesser? Because they're not as important as the primary character. They're important enough to get a POV, but they're not so important that we're going to give them equal time and space. So their arc of, oh my God, I don't know if I can reconcile with my previous ex- previous family, my ex-wife, my daughter, et cetera. I don't know if I can reconcile that in the face of this new relationship I'm getting back with character A. It comes up less frequently. It gets less detail. It is the lesser arc. Remember that when we talked about the subplot structure, we wanted to try and line up the, char- the climaxes, right? Your character's arc your character arc climax should align with and be the climax of the story, period. Why? Because that character arc has to pass through the relationship. If it doesn't, then the relationship's not very important or the arc's not very important to the relationship. And if that's the case, why are you spending so much time and space in the book on it? The character's arc, their progression from who they were to who they are now through the challenges is part and parcel of that relationship because it's supposed to be investing in that relationship that moves them along the arc. The reason why they're changing, the reason why they feel suddenly more attractive or why they're more interested or why they're pursuing different things is because of the influence that relationship has on them. The character arc's climax should be, is the climax of the story. Nail down your character's arc, not just what they do, because that's part of it, but that's a very superficial on some level part of it. It's just a matter of, well, they do stuff. They save the world. That's an action. Actions are not, if if you're a Patreon person, you've heard me say this constantly, actions alone are not arcs. Arcs are progressions. Arcs are whole problems that come up, get dealt with, and get answered. And it changes the character as a result. Just doing something without talking about the change it gives you makes it just an action. We want to see the change. We want to see the impact of the event. Line up your character arc with the climax of the story. That's your greater arc. So that's going to be your primary character. Every other arc whether it's a secondary character, whether it's your lesser POV, whether it's you know a tertiary arc out in the world or whatever, all those other arcs should complement or support in some way, shape, or form the greater arc. So while character A is wondering if they're going to you know leave their husband and figure out if they're going to go back to their old college flame and figure out who they are as a person that arc and that struggle is supported by the fact that they're motivated to do that because they're watching character B over there sort out his life. Oh man, my college flame is getting his shit together. So maybe that's a sign I should get back with him. Support and complement your greater arc makes all the arcs involved feel more important. Because if everybody's doing their own thing, if everybody's kind of disparate and detached, it feels like nothing really matters. It feels like nothing connects, and it feels just like you've stacked together a series of events in a book rather than having it tie together. Emotions are the currency of a romance novel. How people feel and how people feel about certain things makes a book come together a lot easier than if they just do stuff and then take their pants off. Which leads me to one sort of, I got a thing in my eye, one sort of critical point. You don't have to make them complicated. They can be satisfying while being simple. And I don't mean simple as in they should be short. That's not the same thing. They just don't need to have like 45 moving parts. It's not a Rube Goldberg machine. It's a character arc. There's a situation, it develops into a problem, I make efforts and strides to resolve that problem, that effort and stride changes me as a person, my arc is resolved. 
It can be whatever. It could be, I have to learn to say no to my college flame, even though I'm putting down part of my life so I can move forward. Or uh, my character arc is I have to get over my fear of heights because all of a sudden I'm an astronaut in space having sex with my husband who's also an astronaut. Or I have to totally be okay with, you know, speaking in public to profess my love to a person who's stuck in a board meeting. Whatever it might be, it doesn't need to be complicated in order to be satisfying. A lot of writers fall into this rabbit hole where they make stuff incredibly super complicated in order to demonstrate that they're really good writers. Like, look at me. I made this thing. I'm so creative, aren't I? You know, like, good for you. You made a thing. Complication does not equal quality. Complication doesn't mean you're better than somebody else. It just means you made a complicated thing. Satisfaction is the goal. Satisfaction is what you're aiming for. Will the reader be satisfied by this? Have you presented it in a way that the reader can contextualize it and feel more or less in the ballpark of what you're trying to make them feel? That's what matters. How many moving parts does not entirely matter. How many steps your character arc should be up to you. However, I'm going to tell you, most of those arcs have a minimum of three steps. You can't get any less than three. A beginning, a middle, and an end. A start of an arc, they do something about the arc, the arc resolves. Ideally, you want more than three. Is there a too far? Sure, there's a too far, but that's obvious. 35 things is too far, unless your book has like 700 parts. Minimum three. A good ballpark number, if you're really trying to push on this, five to seven. Most people can juggle those pretty pretty, pretty easily. It doesn't mean like you get bonus points and an extra cookie if you have eight or nine or ten. That's fine. You just need more than three, okay? Don't complicate this. Don't make it more than it needs to be. It's just the growth of a character from from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. Just move the character along because of the relationship. Weave these things together. If they're detached, everything feels weaker. If they're connected, everything feels more important, monumental, urgent, impactful, fun, good, sexy, whatever. It helps to tie the pieces together. Next. And our last bit world building oh boy romance world building is pretty variable there's there's a lot it could be we talked about how earth modern is our most common framework but it can be a lot of things beyond earth modern and i know right now there is a very common trend especially in traditional spaces to not only have I'm going to make air quotes, realism, but have very grounded, researched realism. What does that mean? That means if you're writing the story about, I don't know, a firefighter who falls in love with his neighbor during firefighting mudslide season, you are going to do, or you, you're supposed, supposed to, making air quotes, do like extensive research about, you know, halogen tools and temperature and para jumping and flame spreading and fire breaking and I got to learn all the term. No. Can some of that stuff help? Sure. But again, there's no quiz on this. There's no like, it has to be a certain way because the reader somewhere is going to point it. Look, come here. Come here. Come here. Look at me right here. Right? Right? Look at this. Pay attention. Any reader that's going to dock you a star because you didn't use the correct number gauge of a hose, fuck them. <laughs> Like, that's an unpleasant life they must have if their big thing on the internet is to try and get a cookie from you because they're going to point out that, you know, this thing, this fact, this hose you invented doesn't have the right number of who's a thing and what of my jiggers. It, it doesn't matter. Researched realism is a trap and a level of paralysis that makes you think things have to be a certain way. They don't. They don't. This is not a matter to see what writer is smarter than other writers. 
doesn't fucking matter. Doesn't fucking matter at all. So let's cover some world building stuff. A smaller world is better than a bigger one. Because when I say a smaller world, I don't just mean like, you know, instead of a kingdom, we have a castle. That's technically smaller, but within that castle, we can have a billion rooms. You, you've got plenty of space. You don't have to just say like, we're going to put them all in one locked room. I mean, you can. I've read an excellent romance novel where the entire couple is just locked in an elevator and they're hashing out all their shit. It was gripping as hell. There was no sex. The only intimacy was them like laughing at each other's jokes. It was dramatic. It made me cry. Smaller is better because it gives you constraints as a writer. Let's address one more note here. So sometimes when the world is smaller, there's still a whole lot of like, how are we going to get from, from here to there? And a lot of writers, there's a very popular trend to take generally, if you have a single character, um, or you can do it in AB structure too, but you have one character where money is not a concern. They're infinitely wealthy or they're so wealthy. It's, it's laughable. Now, some writers will say, Oh, that's because this story is like, you know, uh, a Pygmalion Galatea thing or a pretty woman thing, or like a girl rescued and brought up to the rich side of town thing. Um, yeah, I sure. Like that's not the end of the world, but the problem is infinite money does not increase love. It doesn't just because a character has the ability to never question how we get from point A to point B does not mean, Oh my God, this character loves me so much more because now I'm on a private plane. If that's what you're going for, if, if you're saying, Oh my God, I'm on a private plane, they must love me more. Um, you're missing the fundamental building blocks of your relationship because you're screaming that your characters are crazy shallow. If they, if they, if they immediately interpret like, Oh my God, they love me because of these objects. Maybe your characters are shallow. Maybe that's the whole arc. Maybe that's their thing. They're shallow and they have to learn not to be. I don't know. It's your story, not mine. But understand that the what I refer to as the cheat codes. So that's infinite, infinite money, infinite power, magic, telepathy, supernatural, like absurd level powers. Not just like, I can make shit float. But like, I can turn into every fucking kind of bird in the world. Like big ridiculous level things that eliminate danger and stakes so that you have to create equally ridiculous responses. I can turn into any animal. Oh no. The villain also turns into any animal. Oh, okay. That's great. If we're writing a cartoon, it's a little less practical when we're trying to make somebody relate to the character. Be careful with your magic powers. Be careful with your cheat codes. However, taking this back to world building in general, just like we have world building in all fiction, your world should have rules. Maybe that's physics. Maybe that's gravity. Maybe that's humans breathe, breathe oxygen. Maybe that's things are brief. Maybe it's cars and traffic exist and cell phones exist. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's a high Renaissance kingdom where every merchant has a floppy hat. I don't know. But the rules of the world should serve the story. Not out of convenience. Convenience would be... Uh, a char- the characters face a problem and then all of a sudden, oh, right, here's the solution right here in this room of solutions. We have a whole cup full of solution juice. It should not be convenient because that's eliminating challenge. It should be an opportunity. Why an opportunity? Because in an opportunity, there's a chance it goes wrong. There's a chance that it's not perfect. There's a chance it could mess up. And that tension that I don't know what's going to happen-ness of it is what keeps the reader reading. Ultimately, whatever the rules of the world are, they should facilitate the existence and need to resolve the problems. And it shouldn't, nothing, nothing should be easy. Nothing should be easy for these characters. Moving on to a little bit more structural stuff. I see this a lot and I didn't know how to phrase it, but Explain, um, how do I say this? Explaining something does not mean that you've proved it's necessary. If you've got page upon page of the, the history of the kingdom, why? It's nice that you wrote it. Good for you for coming up with it. 
But just because you've explained a thing or you've given a character a troubled backstory with a lot of stubble and abs and all of a sudden they're sitting there in the rain pouring out their feelings, that that's nice. But explaining a thing does not suddenly make that thing necessary for the story. Explanation by itself is just you taking up some space, writing some stuff. The necessity of a thing. Why does it need to be there? Why is X, whatever it is, in the story? Because we are creating a context for the reader to understand the story. They need X. If we take X out, the reader's not going to see not just the big picture as if there's a quiz, but to understand the feelings I'm trying to give them. They need X. If not, if X is just there, like, oh shit, it's five pages about the backstory of this fucking mountain. It's not necessary. It can be cut. The question should be, your question, while writing, while organizing, while drafting, while revising, this thing, whatever it is, fill in the blank. If I put it in this page, what do I mean? And is anybody going to care? Like, if I introduce this five-page section on the history of these dwarves, is that going to matter? Like, they don't come back up in the story ever again. They're not referenced ever again. We're just sort of hanging out with dwarves for chapter eight. Who's going to care? Consider that level of reader engagement because there's a difference between I wrote this thing and it's, it's cool versus I wrote this thing and it's story critical. I'm not saying that your romance novels need to be starved and gaunt where it's only the critical stuff and nothing else. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, though, what it doesn't need to be is this sort of bloated, tentacled, fractal monstrosity where we go on detour after detour to lay everything out because you don't. Some of that's okay, but it's easy, super easy, to run off and go into these different little subdivisions and excesses. You don't need to. A little goes a long way. And lastly, in the face of research, in the face of structuring the story, in the face of all these things and everything, what matters is not the reader's logic in terms of, that's not how the thing works. The machine, blah, 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 blah. Let me push my glasses up my nose and make sure I get shoved in a locker at school. Um, most important, because we're dealing with relationships, because we're dealing with emotional currency, because we're crafting context, you need to build your story with the logic of the characters making sense. And explaining it alone does not mean it makes sense. It has to be relatable. It has to be understandable. You build with consistent character logic. Why are they doing this thing? Why is it important to them? Why are they changing locations here? Why are we just showing up over there? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? What does the character hope to accomplish by completing this task? Why is this character saying this thing in this place? Why didn't they say it five pages sooner? Why don't they say it two pages from now? Always seek those whys and let the answer to those whys be logic the character has. It makes sense to them and you, the author, can explain it to the reader. I'm character A. The reason I'm telling character B how I feel right now is because I'm feeling insecure, but I'm not able to really verbalize that clearly to character B. I can't say, hey, character B, I'm feeling really insecure right now. I have to put on this, this facade, this bravado of, no, everything's fine, character B. I'm totally down for whatever. We can go do the thing that completely scares me. Let's go hang out near giant birds. I'll be fine when, in fact, character A is freaked the fuck out by giant birds. Build towards character logic and create context for that logic. And I don't care if we're writing a story on Mars. Your reader's going to understand. The minute you fall into the trap of trying to explain or answer or resolve reader logic, assuming you are lacking the, the supernatural telepathic Professor X power of knowing what the reader is thinking, uh, your story is going to start to wobble and ultimately fall apart. Because you're going to start answering questions that nobody's asking. And you're going to start bringing up details that no one's going to wonder about. Because you're so urgently trying to explain away, well, this is why they have that thing in the car. And this is why they have this moment. And that's why they say this thing. And that's why they reference this. No one's asking. No one's going to stop and think twice about why they carry a pack of wet wipes in the car. 
No one needs to know the thrilling backstory as to why they put their sunglasses in that little cubby hole thing in their van. It doesn't need to be like, oh, here's a two paragraph. No, fuck it. They just have sunglasses there. Let's let's move along now. Aim for character logic. It's going to solve just oodles of problems for you before they even get started. Make sense? Are there any questions? Because we're done. That's it. Are there any questions? While I put more tea in my face. It's just Lipton. It was from the neighbor. They brought a whole box over. It was very sweet. They know I drink tea. It's I'm very thankful. It's Lipton. It's fine. I'm chugging through it. Any questions, issues, comments, concerns, etc., etc.? It got very quiet. I do I do see um like I guess that's likes or something. I don't know what that is. It's just thanks. I don't know what to call these things. I've got some some features and bells and whistles I've never seen before, so I assume all is good. Questions? Anybody else we'll get out of here? Uh, all right, so let's let's do some housekeeping first before I hit the outro. Uh, this, hang on, there's a question. If I'm writing a game, oh, Meg, you're writing a game. Hot damn. If I'm writing a game with, say, two to three potential romances a character could pursue, any tips to make them have the same weight? Yes. Let's talk about narrative weight. Narrative weight is the idea of how important a thing is to the character in question. So we have our character, and they could go with, let's call them one, two, and three, just for the sake of our example, okay? So one, two, and three. In order to make one, two, and three all feel like equal choices, I could take one, I could take two, I could take three. Instead of making them all the same thing, like they all eat peanut butter and jelly, which is nice, but uninteresting comparatively because there's no difference between them give one two and three a difference but give give that diff give variation in those differences yeah they all eat sandwiches but one only eats peanut butter and jelly two only eats cheese three only eats you know italian they all eat sandwiches and you are somebody who owns a sandwich shop so you're constantly having to juggle these different needs. You're going to create weight and, and potential connection for them because each of the potential romances, each of the potential romances offers something the others don't. And if we were to combine all our potential romances and fuse them Dragon Ball Z style, it would make the ideal partner. One of the very common things to do with a, with a, Love triangle, which is something I didn't talk about today, is that if we took the people we were choosing between the bad boy and the rule follower, if we fuse them together, we'd get the perfect partner. So if we have two, three, four, five, 10, 15 people, we are essentially segmenting the ideal, the, the ideal partner down into constituent pieces and giving one piece, one fragment into each one of these potentials. On some level, it's going to be unsatisfying. On some level, it's going to be, you know, like, oh, man, it'd be great if, you know, it wasn't just one person or it could be both of them. In fact, most, it's interesting because most love triangles can be resolved with, like, good communication and polyamory, but a lot of uh, heteronormative authors are not prepared emotionally for that answer. So I I tend to keep that one on the inside. Um because a lot of romance plots can be resolved with maybe you should just talk about your feelings. But if you've got multiple potentials, you want to make sure that each choice is different, but they each provide the person who could choose them, provide that choosing person something different they can't get somewhere else. Then no matter what, 
if all the things they offer are important to the character. One offers me a chance to express my feelings. Two offers me a chance to feel attractive. Three offers me a chance to feel validated. I need all three of those things, but I can only get one from each. So who do I pick? They're all important to me. This creates tension for my choosing character. And it makes the thing I do choose mean something. So if I'm going to choose one, not two and three, then I'm, I'm going to get this. But in a game sense, do I pay a cost for not making the other choices? Is that choice mechanized? Is that choice narrative? Or both. For fiction people hearing this and wondering what the fuck I'm talking about, when I say mechanized, I'm talking about dice. But in fiction terms, when I talk about mechanized, I'm talking about consequential to the story. What happens to the character? What do they lose and how do they feel about it? That's the mechanic in when I say mechanized for fiction. But if I talk about just narratively, like we hand wave it, ah, yeah, I didn't date the bad boy. I went with the rules follower. I guess I'm not wearing a leather jacket at the end of the book. My narrative loss or my narrative gain is fairly minor. Your question, my question to you, Meg, is always going to be from a design standpoint, are my mechanics in support of my narrative or are my mechanics the thing that create uh, conflict to, to move my narrative in different directions? Where do, when do I pick up the dice? When do I make my narrative? When do I spin my spinner? When do I flip my coin? What, and, and what does that choice of mechanical opportunity give me that I couldn't get elsewhere? Why make it a mechanic and not just a hand wave. There's your there's your crunchy root thing. Side note. Sometimes it's just because Meg wants me to roll dice. That's a totally legit answer. But give them weight based on what they offer and how strong a need that offered thing is. I really need to feel validated, so I'm going to lean towards the character who's going to make me feel validated. I need that as much as I need someone to say, hey, John, you're really nice looking, and it's nice to look at you, and you should feel better about how you appear. So I'm going to go towards that person. But I also need somebody who's going to, you know, just make me feel good and remind me that there's color and brightness in the world. So I'm going to lean for that too. Ideally, if I fused all those things together, I'd have one person who, you know, was like good and stuff. Um, I hope that answers your question, Meg. If not, find me tomorrow and I'll like talk into the microphone at length. Uh, Troy is curious. Have I ever read Ron Edwards essays on role playing games? I think probably it's been a while. I did a lot of drugs. Um, it's possible. The name rings a bell. In very, I'm sure I have at some point. I'm sure I have at some point. I can't recall them off the top of my head right this second, but I'm, I'm reasonably certain I have. The name really sticks out to me. I will go Google them later and double check, but I'm reasonably certain I have, so I'm going to say yes, question mark. Any other questions? Yes, I'm ending early, but, well, it's not really early. I tend to do these in about two-hour chunks because... It's two hours. That's plenty of time. And I'm going to run out of voice. And, and I, I wanted to have a cup of cocoa. I haven't had a cup of cocoa in four goddamn days. I've been planning to have this cup of cocoa since like last week. Tonight's the night I'm getting it. Are there any other questions, issues, stuff, etc.? If not, we will go to the outro. Outro then. Yeah, I'm using the Wednesday outro music. Thank you, every single person for being here. Thank you for checking this out. Thank you for watching the stream. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your likes. Thank you for everything. This was great to get back in the saddle and in the swing of things. I really appreciate it. Uh, this audio is going up onto the podcast feed for tomorrow, for Tuesday at the time of recording. This video, which I think is already technically viewable on YouTube as a live stream, will be uh, permanently 
gets ensconced as a YouTube video tomorrow. So everything will be available within certainly 24 hours. I'm not going to load it up overnight, but it'll be out tomorrow for sure. And I'll post about it on social media. Thank you so much for being here. It really means the world. The next time I'm here, by the way, is Wednesday. I'll be right back here for the writer's chat at 7 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday, February 8th. So that's two days from now. If you enjoyed this, if this was good for you, if you dug this, if this was nice and you want to support this and see more stuff like this happen, uh, patreon.com slash John helps you write better. Uh, your support means the world to me, keeps the lights on, keeps the camera going, keeps everything and me alive and kicking. It would mean a great deal. If you like this, leave a comment down below. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications. And if you're on Twitch checking this out, please, if you're not already, consider following and subscribing. Following is free. Subscribing means I get to eat food. It's pretty rad. We all get to win. I look forward to being right back here Wednesday night, the 8th of February at 7 p.m., answering your questions with the writer's chat. If, by the way, you want to know what those questions are, uh, patreon.com. Jump to the Discord. I've already got a first draft up. The questions will be finalized tomorrow. And if you want to suggest questions, that's the best place to do it. Thank you so much for being here. All power to all people. I love you all. I'll talk to you very, very soon. We will probably do another one of these in the very near future. Uh, stay tuned to the newsletter. John helps you write better.com slash newsletter for more. All right. See ya.